So welcome everyone to this um, webinar. It's the last one actually in our webinar series uh, on agricultural value chains. And again, we record this uh, webinar and uh, the webinar will later be published on the SNRD website. Um, so I have to inform you about that. Um, this webinar today has a focus on employment promotion as part of agricultural value chain development. And um, yeah, as you all know, in development countries, uh, over 60% of the population is below the age of uh, 25 and the majority of these people live in rural areas um, with an average unemployment rate of about uh, 40%. Uh, they are disproportionately affected by not having a job compared with the broader global population. And at the same time, uh, food and nutrition security remains a big challenge um, when the world soon will reach about 9 billion people living on the earth. So this is why job creation for youth in rural areas actually has been increasingly important and why we important have a focus um, in this webinar uh, today on exactly today. that. So we have today Alfons so Eilekman with us always, uh, who is a board member of the International Value Links Association. ValueLink's master trainer since 2007 and he will um, at the very beginning answer question on, uh, questions on what ValueLink's has to offer with regard to promoting employment and then later we hopefully um, have uh, Kwame Yeboa with us who is assistant professor at the International Development Department of Agricultural, Food and Resource Economics at the Michigan State University who will share with us some results uh, of their current research focusing on Africa's evolving employment trends. We furthermore have uh, Frank Bertelmann with us, uh, who is the project manager of the new sector project uh, focusing specifically on uh, employment and also youth employment. So he will also give us uh, some insight on their work. And as always, please feel free to ask your questions by using the chat function or by using your microphone. And uh, so I would say we start and uh, I hand over to Alphonse. Yes, hello. Welcome everybody also from my side. And um, I would like to start with a short statement. The statement is many value chain projects can show good results in terms of increasing income, but struggle to demonstrate clear impact on employment creation. Uh, how do you see that? Would you rather agree or disagree? And uh, please uh, give us your feedback on the statement, whether you agree or disagree. And in addition, um, it's a question whether you came across any value chain project that uh, impressed you with creating employment. Uh, what employment impact do you remember in case that you saw a project that is particularly interesting? Um, so if you have anything to share there, please also give us your feedback and information about it in the chat function. As Karina already said, in fact, we would appreciate, like in the last webinars, um, if you add always to the discussion by using the chat function. And we will see that. And uh, Anne-Marie, who is with us, will uh, go through and will summarize your feedback and contributions from time to time. So yeah, we will be interested in, in seeing already what uh, you would like to contribute here. Okay, thank you, Alphonse. And here's the first question that we're interested in today. What is the linkage between agricultural value chain promotion and employment? I would like to start with a quote from the new Value Links 2.0 manual, where Value Links 2.0 says, all developing countries run through a process of structural change in which people leave subsistence agriculture, seeking employment in services and manufacturing. Well, I think that's a general trend that we always see, and that sets a bit the framework for our agricultural value chain promotion. Kwame Yeboah will show us later some clear figures about these trends. Uh, farmers leave subsistence farming as it does not allow them anymore to fulfill what they expect from life. It's not enough to earn a decent income, to nourish a family, to ensure a good 
education for children. What does this mean now for our value chain promotion? Regarding value chain promotion and employment, there are two main lines of argumentation. The first is value chain promotion always aims at increasing value chain competitiveness. Increased value chain competitiveness should lead to economic growth. And this increased economic growth should lead to either more employment and or higher income of the different value chain actors. So in the end, we aim at increasing employment opportunities, for instance, in food processing, or we aim at increasing the income of farmers. We want to take them out of subsistence agriculture, turn them into commercial farmers to make a meaningful income. There's a second line of argumentation, and that's about structural change of the value chain. And this means we are not only interested in increasing jobs or increasing the income, but we are also interested in better jobs, in safer jobs, in better working conditions, in social protection. Uh, the key word there is decent growth uh, or decent work. We want to have a safe working environment. We want to have working conditions that are not harmful for the health of the workers and we want to have social protection. Um, this, these better working conditions particularly play a, a big role in the promotion of industrial value chains. It's a big topic when we talk about uh, the garment value chain, for instance, but it's also a point for agricultural value chain development. For instance, reducing heavy manual work um, thinking about uh, work safety of agricultural workers. So we have two main lines of argumentations. We want to have more jobs, higher income, and on the other side also better jobs. Karina? Yes, thank you very much, Alphonse. Now, what has actually value links to offer when it comes to employment promotion? Yeah. Um, there we should see that value links, actually employment is a cross-cutting issue for all the different value links modules and that starts already with module one, value chain selection. When we promote value chains, we usually have the potential to create employment, to create jobs uh, among one of the key criteria for value chain selection which value chain offers higher chances for job creation. Uh, for instance, in agricultural value chains, value chains that need less resources in terms of having large areas of land um, or value chains where the processing of agricultural products offers reasonable chances for employment creation. The other point for value chain selection and employment is um, where do we have value chains where we have a particular need and a potential to improve working conditions? For instance, if we have a value chain that is characterized by very poor working conditions, this can be a positive criteria for the selection of the value chain if we see a realistic chance to improve the working conditions. The next module is module two, value chain analysis. Um, what we have to do there is to assess both on-farm and off-farm employment at the different value chain levels. What is the actual uh, employment that is provided at farming level? What is the employment that is provided at trading, processing or service provision level? Um, and what is new to Value Links to Zero is that we also take a much closer look at the labor conditions, at the working conditions, and at women and youth employment in the framework of our social value chain analysis. Module three, value chain strategy. Um, we suggest particular uh, strategies like entrepreneurship promotion, skills development programs, women or youth employment strategies. So there are um, different ways how to address employment issues uh, figure among our value chain promotion uh, strategy options. And when it comes to uh, our value chain upgrading solutions, modules five to 10, um, first 
in module five, business models, um, we think about business models with particular employment impact. Uh, in module six, it's a question how to create more employment at the level of cooperatives or trading companies. Module seven, service provision. It's a question what kind of service provision needs to be intensified to uh, improve the employability of people in the value chain, like for instance, vocational training, or uh, what employment possibilities the value chain can offer in terms of uh, value chain service providers that can offer um, important services to the value chain members and that are at the same time employment opportunities. Um, module nine, fair, uh, standards, uh, quality and standards is also important as it touches the point of corporate social responsibility um, and other um, standards that are important for the value chain. And module 10, labor market laws and regulations, for instance, in terms of um, minimum wage or other regulations. And again, module 11, data management and monitoring. Uh, of course, we get back to the issue uh, that we had in module two, assessment of on-farm and off-farm employment. And we have to monitor to what extent we have additional employment in the value chain at the different levels and to what extent particularly women and youth benefit, benefited from the project. So this, so this is for value links to zero and the different uh, modules, what they have to do with employment. Yeah, thank you, Alfons, for this nice overview. Now, what kind of results are we aiming at? I've put here five different results on the PowerPoint slide. First, increased employment. Uh, I already said, in general, many projects um, aim at increased employment and also have a criteria criterion on increased employment in um, their monitoring system. In detail, we aim at on-farm, off-farm employment at the different levels, processing, trading, and services. And it's also important that uh, on one side, we aim at qualified jobs to um, have more qualified jobs provided by the value chain. In some cases, we also aim at um, uh, providing more unqualified jobs uh, in the framework of our value chain promotion as for rural employment and for the poorest of the poor without education, without skills, without um, resources. Uh, sometimes these unqualified jobs that can be created in the value chain are the most important for poverty alleviation. Um, we aim at better paid employment, increase in the salary of self-employed farmers, of small-scale farmers, increase in the income or in the salaries of, um, of employed workers um, in the value chain. We aim at decent employment, improved employment conditions. We also aim at more formal employment in the value chain, um, work contracts, um, long-term employment, um, reliable employment, and less fragile employment uh, conditions. Um, another aim is to improve employability. Um, reduce the mismatch between skills needed and the given skills of jobs. And we look at uh, safer employment, better employment conditions, laws, and so on. Thank you very much. And the last question now for you, Alphonse, what particular tools do we have to promote employment and where are potential trade-offs? Yeah. Um, the first particular tool for improving on-farm employment um, are improved business models of, in parenthesis, uh, small-scale farming. Um, so to come up with business models for farmers that ensure that they get a relevant and significant income. And to give one example here, I find uh, the farmer business school approach of GIZ quite convincing. That always starts with the basic principle to show the difference between extensive farming and on the other side what can be uh, improved and how income can increase if farmers turn to intensive farming 
And um, I always have in mind here, once I met uh, a young cocoa farmer deep in the bush somewhere in Ghana, who impressed me when he said that he had already moved to Accra uh, because he could not make uh, a reasonable living of his two hectare of cocoa farm. Um, but when the FPS approach showed him how or what kind of income he can generate um, if he turns to more intensive exploitation of the cocoa uh, farm, then this convinced him to move back to the village um, because he felt that with intensive farming, he can make a better income than with a less qualified, poorly paid job in Accra. So I think this shows quite clearly the potential that we have here for on-farm employment to promote it with improved business models of small-scale farming. And this is taken up by a number of entrepreneurship promotion tools like FBS, like the BUS uh, farmer uh, training approach in Germany, like GIZ's business loop, like ILO's uh, start and improve your business. Um, entrepreneurship and prom uh, promotion as the main tool to promote better employment um, at farm level or also for processing of agricultural products. Um, vocational training, pro innovative business models in processing, trading and services can be the same, can be similar. Um, what possibilities are there with the, to earn uh, a good income with, with processing, trading or service provision of the agricultural product. Um, then we talk about vocational training programs to reduce a mismatch between skills needed by value chain actors um, and the skills that job seekers are lacking. Uh, vocational training programs can be a win-win situation for um, job seekers and on the other side value chain actors and such skills development programs can be developed and implemented uh, sometimes in cooperation between the public and the private sector. Um, Public-private partnerships or development part partnerships are particularly important when it comes to better working conditions in the value chain, uh, particularly with regard to corporate social responsibility standards. Uh, labor laws, regulations, well, things like um, a minimum wage, like regulations on working hours, like introduction of insurances, pension funds, use of protective gear, um, and also questions of funding of education and training programs that improve employability are important. To finish this part, I would still like to point out to two potential trade-offs or two trade-offs that um, we see often. Um, I think aiming at increasing agricultural productivity, uh, we very often see an increased mechanization of value chains that may lead or that leads often not to job increases, but to job losses. Um, before we started with the seminar, I just told Karina about uh, what I always see in Cambodia or in Vietnam, where 10 years ago, um, you saw many or you saw thousands of farmers in the rice fields uh, cultivating rice manually and harvesting rice manually. In the last 10 years, this changed totally and you don't see any more water buffaloes in the rice field. Instead, you see small hand tractors that everybody has and you see rice harvesting machines instead of manual rice harvesting. And my impression is that uh, when we talk about agricultural development in sub-Saharan Africa, we are just at the beginning of a, uh, of a mechanization trend in agriculture and we'll have the same in Africa. We will not have an increase, increase in employment in agriculture, we'll have a further strong decrease in employment. So there's a trade-off between our modernization and, um, and the intended objective to create jobs. 
And also, when we talk about value chain upgrading, um, very often we aim at having a better organization of the value chain, better business linkages, not so many different levels of intermediary traders. And I would see a trade-off there that uh, also there for trading, we may lose jobs when we promote agricultural cooperatives, um, a number of middlemen may drop out of the business. Uh, so these are also some trade-offs that we see for value chain development. Yes, thank you very much, Alfons, for this nice overview. Now, uh, I would like to go back to the statement um, that was on the very first slide on the impact of employment creation. and. Uh, several participants actually uh, gave us their opinion and I would like to hand over to Anne to uh, summarize it a bit um, and give us a short overview on the overall opinion. Thank you, Karina. Um, regarding the first statement um, that um, value chain projects often show good results in uh, increasing income but struggle to demonstrate clear impact on employment creation, uh, most of you agreed, um, 11 uh, people from the audience agreed, only one person disagreed and um, stated that it's always a question of, of methods. And regarding the, the second question, um, we asked you to uh, give us some examples of, of value chain projects that impressed you with uh, creating employment. And um, you, you mentioned two, um, a value chain in Tanzania, where more than 100 women were employed in a cleaning factory. And a second um, best practice project uh, from Kenya. Um, that was aiming at um, um, promoting energy saving stoves. Um, one of the big impacts was that more people started working um, in, in this sector in building and trading stoves. Back to you, Karina. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so now actually I would like to uh, invite uh, Kwame Yiboa, who is who managed to finally be with us now. Um, to present us the first results of their research. Uh, so, welcome, Kwame. Okay, all right. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for this opportunity to share some of the work that myself and my colleague, um, Tom Jane, have been doing, that is um, looking at the evolving dynamics in Africa's employment structure and um, its implications for youth employment opportunities. So Africa happens to uh, be the youngest as well as the fastest growing population in the world. The population is expected to double, uh, reaching about 2 billion uh, by 2050. And this, the continent currently have about 62% uh, of the population below the age of 25. So this rapid population growth, coupled with the demographic structure that the continent has, uh, presents a huge employment challenge to African policy uh, makers. So in thinking about uh, this, one of the things that we've been thinking about is what is the nature of this youth employment challenge? And what is the role of agriculture and food systems in addressing the youth employment challenge? That is looking at how the employment structure is and how it might uh, be in the future. And then what are some of the key trends within the economic and the social landscape that could influence the job creation potential of agricultural and the food uh, systems? So I'm going to try and address these questions um, bit by bit. So the, f the first one is, um, what is the nature of the youth employment challenge? Conceptually, I uh, believe that there are three main aspects of the youth employment challenge. The first one relates to the slow demographic uh, transition that is occurring in the region that I've seen labor force grow by about 3% per year and um, seeing about 11 million young people entering the labor force um, each year. And with uh, fertility rates still hovering around some, somewhere, um, somewhere four to five, it, it appears that a youth board may not end any time um, soon. I believe the, the, the second challenge has also got to do with the 
quality of the labor that is uh, being supplied or the job readiness of those that are entering the labor force. Generally, we are seeing that um, although this cohort of uh, young people seems to be better educated in terms of educational attainment, the educational level seems to be very low. Um, so we have two in three Africans um, youth still do not have um, secondary school education. So there's a low awareness of these opportunities that are in the agri-food um, value chain. And then, and then finally, the, the third part is uh, relates to the slow growth in, in jobs. Um, job, the creation of uh, decent jobs has generally lagged behind the labor force growth. And the evidence suggests that even in the most optimistic scenario, the uh, less than a quarter of the 11 million people that is entering the labor force each year will find wage employment. And part of the reason is that unlike in East Asia that had a manufacturing um, sector booming that absorbed labor coming out of agriculture, the manufacturing sector in Africa had essentially uh, been very slow to, to grow. So one big challenge is creating that job. And it's a combination of all these factors that have generated the youth employment challenge and uh, which manifests itself in the rise in employ unemployment and underemployment that we see in the uh, in the region. So um, it is widely accepted that agriculture and food system might play an important role in addressing the youth employment challenge. So in thinking about this in trying to understand that we um, try to first of all look at the employment structure um, and how that employment structure is changing over time. So uh, we computed employment both in um, the levels as well as the changes in employment over time for, um, for several countries. And then um, we looked at employment not just in the count of jobs, that is when a person says they are involved in farming, then that is one. Um, but we also look at it in terms of full time um, equivalence, the amount of time that they spend in there. And that one we do by um, weighting each employment by the total amount of time that a person spent there. And we do realize that when you weight employment by the total amount of time, the share of employment in farming actually declines, mainly because farming is seasonal and many people are unable to undertake uh, engage in farming um, throughout the year. So in those times when uh, um, they are not able to engage in farming, um, so, so, so when you weight the engagement in farming by um, by the time that they, 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 they have, the, the, the share declines. While that in the oil farm sector um, also uh, increases correspondingly. Uh, but in, in looking at the employment structure, what we find is, is that um, over the past decade, there has been um, a general decline in the share of employment in farming. Um, we, uh, and that share is quite, um, the, the rate of decline is um, it's a little bit uh, variable across countries. So, for example, in Rwanda, in Tanzania, in Uganda, and in Zambia, we see rapid rates of decline. Um, whereas in a place like Nigeria, the uh, decline has been slow, or we have seen very minimal declines, which we believe could be um, a function of uh, the negative effects of natural resource boom on our structural transformation process. Uh, but despite its declining employment share, we realize that farming still remains um, very important to the livelihoods of people. It's still the largest single employer for most in most of the countries that we have uh, we were able to as, as, examine um, in Rwanda, in Tanzania, even when you are looking at it in FTE terms. Remember, when you look at it in terms of job counts, farming employment share will increase by about 10 percentage points. And then when um, you do a gender and age disaggregated analysis, we also realize that there's a large number of young people that are engaged in farming, even at a higher rate than the overall uh, population. So there's an example from Tanzania where 
about 82% of the FTE jobs for males and 67% of FTE jobs for females um, between the ages of 15 and 19 is in farming. And this um, essentially reflects the low barriers that they encounter working on that, um, work, work, working in farming um, because they have opportunities to work on their uh, on their family farm, and, um, and and it could also reflect some of the activities that their parents may be doing. Because what we also see is as young people enter the labor force and get more integrated into labor activities, they reduce their engagement in farming, as we see that with the young adults. Now, when you move out of farming, um, we realize that there's rapid percentage growth um, in the off-farm sectors, um, particularly uh, in the, uh, the off-farm agri-food system, as well as in the non-farm um, uh, sector, which is outside the agri-food system. But, but generally, the, the non-farm sector is where the largest share of off-farm employment is currently, and it accounts for between about 36 to about 47 um, percent of total FTE uh, jobs. And we also see that there's a similar rapid growth that is occurring in the off-farm sector within agricultural value chain. So when you're talking about the agri, when you're talking about the uh, processing, um, the food distribution, and all those food food services activities, but that growth is generally starting from a very low base, and even in FTE 10, for most of the candidates that we have looked at, the current share of off farm jobs is less than about 20 uh, percent of total FTE jobs, and an interesting finding is that. Uh, most of the jobs that we are seeing within the agricultural value chain that is outside uh, farming is concentrated in the downstream commerce and um, distribution. So those marketing activities and less in the agro processing uh, side, which in itself is, is quite interesting because um, it's, it's, it's also, it could also be symptomatic of um, the slow growth of manufacturing in the uh, in, in in the region uh, generally. Now, um, so so we started thinking about what might be driving this kind of transformation that we are um, seeing. And historically, agricultural productivity growth have been a key driver of um, <clears throat> of labor exit out of farming, as well as um, growth in off farm. Employment. So we did a bivariate analysis as well as a multivariate econometric analysis to be able to uh, um, understand the extent to which agricultural productivity growth is playing that kind of role. And we realized that um, in the bivariate analysis, um, we realized over the past 15 years, those countries um, like Rwanda and, um, and even to extend Zambia that were able to increase their agricultural productivity growth, they also experienced the most rapid exit of labor out of agriculture, uh, out of farming into the off-farm sector. And those same countries also experienced the highest growth in um, non-farm labor productivity um, growth. And when we did econometric analysis controlling for all the other plausible factors that could be affecting um, declines in farming employment share. We also identify lack labor productivity growth in agriculture to be an important determinant of the rate of exit of labor out of agriculture. And those patterns is very consistent with what happens in a place like in Asia where um, increasing ag uh, agricultural productivity growth coming from um, green revolution technologies was able to raise income of millions of farmers whose expenditures in the rural economy stimulated um, job growth in the off-farm 
uh, in the oil farm sector and then eventually drew people from farming to fill those jobs in the oil farm um, sector. So in the same way, we believe that the rate of job creation in agricultural value chains, especially because those that particular sector depends on the farm sector for inputs, um, the rate of job creation is going to be very much dependent on how well um, the productivity grow on the farm. And there's already evidence indicating that large-scale agro-processing in Africa has been impeded by the lack of supply of raw materials of consistent quality and quantity um, in Africa. And it also, so it also implies that um, job growth in the off-farm sector, um, that, that is, you're looking at the non-farm sector outside agri-food system, would also depend on productivity growth, considering the large number of people that are engaged in there. Uh, because to be able to create the a bigger multiplier effects, you need a large number of people to have their income grow. So you need a broad-based income growth. And increasing productivity on farm will affect the greatest number of people who and then create, generate that broad-based and inclusive income growth that will expand the employment opportunities in the off-farm um, sector. Now, um, there are also some other factors that are, are at play here um, that could um, inhibit productivity growth and or, uh, or, or could increase productivity growth and um, influence the employment potential within the agri-food um, system. There are a number of them, but I'm just going to focus on a few, um, highlighting some of the trends that is happening. So the first one that I would want to talk about is, is a growing domestic food um, demand. So um, as population is increasing and urbanization and also incomes rises in these uh, across Africa, we are seeing a growing demand for food. And um, this demand um, has, is, is, is now shifting towards more diversified foods, fruits and vegetables. Um, we also see high value uh, demand for high value proteins. And overall food demand in the region is expected to expand for about 55%. Um, as the continent's um, value of, the, the continent's agricultural and food systems um, value reaches about one trillion by 2030. So there is an opportunity to be able to create job, uh, create employment uh, if this if local capacity could be enhanced to um, <clears throat> to supply that uh, that that demand that we currently have. Unfortunately, uh, now much of that demand is filled by imports. And we've seen between 2000 and 2014, imports of food across the continent rose um, from about 6 billion to about 45 billion. That is for 2014. And the latest figure that I have um, coming from assets indicates that the current figure is about 68 billion and it's supposed to rise up to about 110 billion by 2025 if current trends um, continue. Um, if we are going to be able to create employment uh, and, and take advantage of this, then we will need to address some of the capacity um, constraints that are there within the, um, not just in farming, but also in the um, global, but also in the, in the supply chains of these um, commodities, some of which I've already highlighted, the skill sets, um, that, that, that need to be addressed. The physical infrastructure, the energy, the, the road, the cold storage facilities that is needed, especially when it comes to those dairy products, and also the access to, uh, to services. And to the extent that those are, are going to be addressed, we could be able to realize um, huge employment coming out of it. But to the extent that employment, continue, to the extent that imports becomes a primary means of filling, um, uh, filling the demand of food, uh, the, uh, the increasing demand, 
then employment may still grow, um, but those sectors that are um, within the upstream stages of the agri-food system, like jobs in farming, in agro, um, input supply, in the services for farmers, and even ag agro-processing may not be able to grow um, as much. Then the other issue has also got to do with access to, to land. So generally there is um, this widespread perception that uh, there is land available on the continent, but our analysis indicates that about 90% of the available land in Africa is concentrated only in nine countries. Uh, and most of them are what you may even describe as politically fragile um, countries. So like Sudan, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, um, in Zambia, the Central African Republic. So majority of African countries, or at least about 45% of them, are currently either land constrained or approaching the limits of their um, land extent. And um, rural youth typically used to be able to acquire land primarily through inheritance. Now, as healthcare increases, um, as healthcare improves, we are seeing increases in life expectancy, which means that um, even when land is available, young people will now have to wait till later time when they are older to be able to inherit land. So there is an issue of whether land will be available um, for agriculture for agriculture for these young people. And compounding this problem is uh, we are also seeing this rise in interest in arable land in Africa, both from international investors as well as local African-based um, elites. And this is evidence in a rise in the um, what we call the medium and large scale farms who are increasingly accounting for um, a larger share of total agricultural land as well as the value of agricultural um, marketed um, crop output. Now, um, as Alphonse had alluded to, that uh, this group tends to be more mechanized. They tend to capitalize in their production systems and um, they do not use a lot of labor. So to the extent that we overall agricultural production patterns continue to shift towards this group, the employment potential that we could realize coming from agriculture and food systems will go down. Now, another um, area has also got to do with soil degradation, but um, as average farm size shrinks and land become more scarce, we are seeing farmers continuously cultivating their land without, so, uh, um, without fallows or even applying soil improvement um, approaches. And this is leading to rapid soil degradation on the continent. And one estimate from the Montpellier panel indicates about 65% of arable land in Sub-Saharan Africa is already degraded. And over 180 million smallholders are already affected by that. Um, we, uh, sustainable intensification methods uh, could provide an avenue to be able to salvage the situation. Uh, but to the extent that is persistent degradation continuum, uh, continuum um, is going to depress agricultural productivity growth and the result and employment effect that may arise uh, from that. And then the other issue has got to do with climate change, um, which is also projected to have greater effects on Africa's agriculture, um, coming from the variability in the quantity and the timing of rainfall, the, uh, t the variable temperature regimes, and also the increase of pest, weed, uh, and then diseases uh, that may affect crops and livestock in the uh, in the area, and um, the extent to which employment could be realized will depend on how these smallholder farmers could be supported uh, to adapt to the changing conditions uh, that um, affect productivity growth in the area uh, in in agriculture. So in, in the 
in concluding uh, and by way of recapping, uh, we generally have seen that um, there's rapid economic transformation happening across the continent at least since um, 2000. And um, this is seen in a rapid exit of labor from farming into all farm sectors. And we have seen also that agricultural productivity growth seems to be a key driver of this trend um, that we are seeing and it will continue to play an important role um, in the future. Yeah, um, farming influence is, is, also, is also very important. Um, currently, although we are seeing declining shares in farming, farming is still the single largest employer of the labor force and it offers an important opportunity to be able to create that broad-based income um, growth that will expand employment opportunities in the off-farm sector. Um, in terms of um, the agri-food system, off-farm jobs within the agri-food system, we have seen rapid percentage growth and much of it, um, of the jobs is still concentrated in commerce and distribution and less in agro-processing. So there is some scope in developing the agro-processing uh, sector to be able to meet the rising demand for food that we are seeing the processed food and high value foods uh, but again stimulating that will also um, require that we also stimulate on-farm productivity to be able to supply the inputs that it needs to uh, it needs for its growth and then um, last conclusion is that the rate of job creation in the um, agri-food system will definitely be influenced by access to land, um, the land degradation, the level of reliance on in food imports as I already indicated, and also um, climate change. So based on this, uh, we ask uh, what are some of the uh, key priority areas uh, to consider? I personally believe that um, a, um, an important component of uh, a comprehensive view of employment strategy should include the promotion of broad-based agricultural productivity growth. Um, first of all, to be able to increase um, incomes and also opportunities in farming for those that are already engaged in farming, um, but most importantly, to be able to generate and multiply effects that will expand employment opportunities um, in the off-farm sectors, both within the off-farm agri-food system as well as the um, non-farm sector. And doing so may require some key strategic policies, um, and m much of it have, has been proven and quite known, uh, which is a public investment th that improve on-farm productivity, like res uh, research, and development, extension services, infrastructure, and also reducing some of those barriers to private um, investment in um, agricultural value chains. There's also a need for uh, investment in, uh, to improve skills and the competitiveness within the agri-food systems. The future agri-food system is going to be is, um, knowledge intensive and adding any kind of value will require different kind of skills than what people currently have. So there's a need to be able to invest in quality education, vocational training, um, it could be mentoring programs that will help people acquire those skill sets. And um, personally, I believe that helping them to acquire those skill sets will allow them to be able to spot opportunities that are coming, um, that are coming up within agricultural value chains um, in, and that may even be a better approach than us identifying agricultural value chain. So, okay, this value chain might be very promising, so go into it, and then that value chain may end up changing tomorrow. And because these value chains changes um, quite often, giving them the skill sets that allow them to be able to identify which ones is promising at different times will be a valuable um, asset for these young people. And then lastly, uh, there is a, a need to uh, be able to create a responsive youth employment uh, policy making by instituting systems for understanding 
the changing needs of, of young people and then the, of, uh, and then the labor market uh, conditions. Uh, we currently have very limited data on um, the conditions of young people in there, and all those are currently are uh, things that uh, are areas that we are um, that um, we are currently trying to collect data on. So a better understanding, uh, an investment in trying to uh, collect more data in that particular area, as well as into areas, um, as well as into understanding which how well programs work, program evaluation, how well programs works, and um, in, and which one does not work well, will be very uh, will serve us well uh, going forward. In other going forward, and then and then one last point will be much of the policy dialogue is divorce of uh, the youth voice, and strengthening youth voice in the policy dialogue will be critical because I believe the young people know much about their problems than um, we do and getting them involved in a policy dialogue will help strengthen and guide the policy in directions that um, is favorable uh, to them and so that, that we can also be able to get a buy-in um, to it. Okay. So thank you. Yeah, Kwame, thank you very much for this very interesting presentation and sharing your results um, with us. And I've already seen there are several questions uh, and remarks, uh, and we are going to, or you are going to answer them in a second. Um, before that, I would like to give the word to Frank Bertelmann uh, from the Sector Project on Employment, uh, who will uh, give us a short introduction on the work of the Sector Project as well as the 2018 survey on aggregated indicators with regard to employment. Frank, please. Thanks a lot, Katharina, and also thanks a lot to, to Kwame for this very interesting presentation. Um, I think it's really um, great to see the empirical trends and results because we, this is what we often lack and um, which really gets a, um, a big value added to to our discussion, especially for um, discussions with BMZ and asking what are conclusions for policy making, for project designs. I think this is really urgently needed. And I think we also had some other um, data and results from West Africa from a study with the OECD and looked at some ILO figures. And I think the overall trend is very clear that um, employment in agriculture will decline in the medium to long term period. But I think we also see different trends on diff for different countries. And I think also um, demand side developments, price hikes since the 2011 price crisis, I think also give us some, some positive trends. So I think also would be interesting to look at, at recent data as well. Um, but um, yeah, I think definitely this is great to add this to the overall discussion and also for us in the sector project, um, it's a very valuable element and yeah, I think just uh, would like to give you a short overview of the new sector project on employment in rural areas with focus in youth, which was initiated end of last year in the um, aftermatch of the German G20 presidency and the G20 initiative on rural youth employment. And therefore it is financed out of the CEVO for a five year term with a relatively small budget, um, but I think also a very classical structure of a sector project. And we are happy to continue to work on, on this topic in the, in the upcoming years. And we are structured in three uh, working areas. The first one on um, policy advice towards BMZ, with focusing on positioning this topic in national and international processes. Uh, we have a second working area on concept development and employment measurement and monitoring, I think, which is also a very crucial one for our projects on, on the ground and the overall topic, and um, to contrast that with also the empirical trends. And the third one on the networking, learning, and also mainstreaming these concepts back into, into our portfolio. So I think these are the main um, entry points for the sector project. And yeah, uh, so we are just starting to, um, to, um, to settle and to um, hire our staff and really get operational. So I think uh, we are very happy to 
to continue and increase our exchange with you and uh, I think also with the sector network on uh, rural, de um, um, rural development in Africa and other sector networks. Um, yeah, so we are very much looking forward to, to the ongoing exchange and just to present you some first work streams and activities we started so far under the sector project which um, have a close relation to monitoring. Uh, the first one uh, is on the GSZ results data, which is um, starting very soon. Um, probably some of you have already heard about it, uh, which will be a survey for all um, projects in um, the rural development theme, but also in other areas. And I think all um, projects will answer a certain set of questions um, regarding on the impacts they will contribute to both rural development but also employment creation. And compared to 2016 where employment indicators focused more on the wage employment side, we now achieved to integrate also um, the informal employment in the agricultural sector with seasonal workers, family labor, smallholders, self-employment. I think all this um, now will go into the indicator 1.2. Uh, measuring um, additional employment in full-time equivalents uh, uh, on top of indicator number 1.1 on really new jobs which are mostly based on uh, in the uh, up and downstream um, industries and processing and um, based on weight employment but I think all the agricultural employment now we can also add up in the indicator 1.2 and we will aggregate um, these indicators for an overall number of additional jobs and employments we achieve um, through GSZ projects. But we will also measure certain quality aspects of employment. So again, also additional employment in terms of number of persons under 1.2, um, then job quality and employment conditions under 1.3 and also um, mostly employment productivity through increased income under indicator 1.4. And here I think as we, um, we have multiple effects, we also will allow for multiple counting. Doesn't mean double counting, but to report separately on the different indicators. I think this is also, I think, a big step forward for um, our overall results um, compilation and the political communication aspect behind it. But I think also we are look very much looking forward for the um, conclusions we can get out of this at, at project level. How many projects do really report to these indicators? How are the quantitative effects? Even though indicators are beyond project level and more general and more aggregated, of course, but I think still a very important exercise for us to, um, to um, look at the results afterwards. So results are probably upcoming by third or fourth quarter as the survey is online until mid of uh, September. And now I think this year it is mandatory for all projects to also answer these questionnaires and I think also will give us a good basis for, for the, um, analyzing the project experiences in that. Then a second work stream uh, we are currently um, working on together with a um, team of Professor Kluwe who already worked with our colleagues from the economic um, development sector on employment measurement but now he's also focusing on the topic of rural employment and basically the idea is to develop a kind of manual and guidelines for project level employment measurement so to set up monitoring systems in the future or see how maybe also with current indicator system uh, certain aspects um, may be um, counted or um, compiled in a kind of sound but still simple methodology. So we are looking for pragmatic solutions without going to very intensive household surveys for any kind of project, especially I think for smaller project that is possible. Not, uh, this is probably not possible to do in all the cases. Uh, so we are trying to combine uh, certain things you have to measure with other things maybe you can also um, use proxy indicators or model in a certain extent or maybe also work with some kind of estimations which somehow can be verified um, and calibrated afterwards through um, other proxy indicators. 
And I think this is like uh, the idea is to go bottom up along certain impact chains and um, uh, impact models, but also top down coming from certain standard indicators, basically on additional employment and quality aspects and, and income issues and labor productivity. And see what kind of data requirements do you have for these um, standard in indicators, what kind of information is available, and how can you come up with a kind of pragmatic mix on do proper monitoring and reporting, but still with uh, somehow uh, limiting the effort. So this is the idea and the approach, and I guess there are certainly limitations to in doing that, uh, but I hope we can somehow uh, provide additional inputs and sound methodologies for the projects and in, in doing that in the future. So I think these are just two um, activities we already started under the sector project. And yeah, as mentioned in the different working areas, we are very, very much looking forward to collaborate with projects on the ground, but also with people here and colleagues in headquarters, other sector projects in the very um, interesting topic which is very high on the agenda at the moment and I think also questions on how this will be built into the discussion on the CEVO 2.0 and the, the special initiative, the Green Innovation Center, they have a job indicator and I think these are also questions which are highly relevant, relevant for us and therefore we would like to also exchange with you and I'm looking very much forward to our discussion now. Thank you very much for the nice introduction of the new sector project. And now I would like to go back to the questions from the beginning from the audience. Uh, Kwame, if you would be so kind to answer them. So the first question was um, full-time equivalence share of farming may decline, but how is this in absolute numbers and how is it when looking at the entire agri-food system, including upstream and downstream activities? Generally, you, you find that when you, if you look if you, in terms of shares, we will see declines um, in farming employment shares. Uh, but the absolute numbers of people engaged in farming is increasing, uh, primarily because of the rapid population growth that we are seeing in, the, in that area. So if you, if you compare, there was a graph that um, I did not include here, which compares the rate at which the absolute numbers is increasing the trend in the absolute numbers in different African countries and that in China. And then you realize that in China, um, the absolute numbers of people who engage in farming started dropping um, sometime in the late 90s. Um, whereas those in, in the African countries that we looked at is still increasing. Um, and, and, and that is why I believe that farming will continue to be the largest single employer, at least over the next um, decade. And when you also look at the absolute numbers um, in farming compared to the um, off-farm sector, uh, the f farming is by far um, the largest, about four, 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 four times, uh, in some countries about four times larger than those in the agri food, uh, the off farms, the off farms that are within the agri food system. Thank you. Um, and now another question regarding Ghana. You showed us that uh, Ghana developed uh, much off farm employment. Um, mm -hmm. So what's the difference between Ghana and the other countries? I think I think um, part of it depends on uh, their different stages on their economic growth trajectory. So even when you look at the uh, GDP um, growth. So if, if you have one country that have um, mm, mm, lower GDP, those countries that are less developed seems to have a larger share of their population engaged in farming. Um, whereas in Ghana might be more developed than some of those countries. So, 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 so you can think of um, Ghana, or you can compare Ghana and and um, Uganda, um, GDP in Ghana is higher than those um, in that in GDP um, in in, the, um, in in Uganda. So that's differences in the level of development account for some of the differences that we are seeing in the employment structure that we have. Um, so, so 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 the level of development um, also tells you the amount. Uh, 
the extent to which the off farm um, sector is developed. And if it is more developed, it can absorb more um, labor into it than if it is um, less developed. Yes, thank you. There was another question regarding um, whether there is a shift chair analysis of African countries that would depict intrasectoral or uh, intersectoral structural change. So, so we have we have done some analysis that um, have had looked at um, whether the structural, um, I think, whether whether there is. Uh, intersectoral productivity growth um, compared to intersectoral productivity um, growth, and um, if if I recall um, correctly, because it's been it's been a while now, but if I recall correctly, then what what we are seeing is structural just uh, what about structural transformation that is um, moving towards producti uh, higher productivity um, has been a little bit. Um, slow. So we had people, instead of moving from low productivity um, work in farming into higher productivity um, work, they sometimes are moving um, from low productivity farming into low productivity service sector. So the improvement that you would expect in overall productivity is not very, it's, it's, it's not going up. That's uh, in, in a way that we would expect it um, to be. So, so, so there has been some sectoral shifts, um, but in terms of productivity increases, um, overall productivity increases have not gone um, up much. There was a question, what uh, makes you personally think that broad-based agriculture growth makes more good jobs available? I, I, I think, um, I can't say that there's a direct correlation uh, between broad-based agricultural productivity growth and the production of good jobs. Um, that is when you're talking about quality. I can say that it's helped generate um, the quantity, the quantity of jobs. But in the same token, I also believe that if you were to have broad-based productivity growth where people's incomes um, increases, um, as income increases, they are going to demand more high value. Uh, products and if they have more money to spend, they will spend on high quality services. And those high quality, the delivery of those high quality services, will generate the quality jobs that 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 you uh, that you will need. Uh, so although there is not that direct correlation between the um, the, the, the 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 broad based productivity growth and the quality of jobs. Probably productivity growth could also contribute to the quality of jobs if it raises that income enough to be able to stimulate um, productive jobs in the oil farm sector. Thank you very much uh, for answering all the questions. Um, now we have a last question that uh, I would like to address to Alphonse. Um, when looking at value chain projects, should um, measure employment, should indicators include both permanent and temporary jobs within the whole chain or just in the production phase? Yeah, thank you very much, Annemarie. Um, yeah, to answer Fikwi's question, um, I think it should particularly also have a look at um, employment in processing and, uh, and the trading uh, part of the value chain. Uh, when you mean here production phase, I understand like a primary production. And uh, I think in general, our value chain projects um, I consider it even a weakness that um, we should we are not enough concentrated on the employment creation and measurement of employment creation um, for non-farm uh, employment. And uh, I think this also came very clearly out of uh, the assessment of Kwame that uh, um, non-farm employment is still um, lagging behind and uh, it's something we are particularly processing. Uh, yeah, there's not as much employment creation as for instance in trading of agricultural products. And it's something where uh, with a value chain approach, this is something where we should put more emphasis on 
we have projects that are not in general agricultural productivity increase projects. We have projects that are value chain projects and we should measure this very clearly. Um, okay, otherwise I would like to say, um, Kwame, for me, I found it particularly interesting the evidence that you provided between high productivity increase in the agricultural um, part of the value chain and on the other side also the employment that is created on non uh, in the non-farming part of our value chains. So this correlation between increased agricultural productivity and then you can see even at the statistical level that this also means more non-farm employment. This I find very interesting. And also I think the strategies that you highlighted in terms of we have to improve skills and competences um, of people to, to be able to, to earn more money, have higher income and better jobs. I think it's important. And uh, in the discussion that we had before the webinar yesterday, I think you had one word you coined uh, or you talked about youth-centered programs to make farming profitable for young people. And I think this is very important. Um, it's structural change. It's something where always the next generation takes it up and has more dynamic uh, to develop it. So um, I think to have some well-shaped, well-planned um, youth-centered programs to make farming more profitable that include, like you said, access to inputs where the project facilitates access to inputs and provides also know-how on farming when you talk about mentoring of experienced farmers. I think this is very important and, uh, and we may need to focus more on medium scale farms and uh, because small scale farming I think in the end is, is limited sometimes in terms of the potential. So we need units that uh, are economically viable that we promote. Um, so these are still a few comments from my side. Um, I think, Frank, you also would like to comment something? Thanks a lot. I think I fully agree, Alphonse, that we need to focus more also on the processing side, especially. But I think we are also, or I would say uh, we need both. We need also to focus on employment creation and also measurement in the production sector, which we also haven't done very much, at least the measuring part. And I think we need to complement that uh, with uh, focus on processing and trading. And I think we need economic opportunities and skills uh, to have a dyna dynamic development along the whole value chain. Otherwise, I think only skills development is not enough. Uh, and it's, it's more difficult also and more investment intensive you now to focus on the processing and, and off-farm sector. And I think sometimes we also with our technical cooperation approach, uh, we have limited answers because access to finance is a crucial issue, even more crucial and more difficult than maybe for working capital in, in agriculture. Thank you very much, Frank. Um, I think we would also still like to give the opportunity to somebody in the audience, some participant here, uh, to say something because uh, we have a, a little um, yeah, a bit the privilege here that uh, we can talk and others uh, are writing. But um, is there somebody in the audience who would also still like to comment uh, and say something and not only write something? Before, uh, coming to an end, I think it is important to, and I think Frank also illustrated this with his new pro sector project on uh, uh, on rural youth employment. It is the topic is here to stay, and I regard today's presentation in as a midway not really a beginning because we have already worked on a couple of issues but i would just like to mention there is more analytical work underway and already finished karina also mentioned the ilo oecd work i think on uh, job opportunities in the agri-food system in west africa just for the uh, colleagues we have circulated these public public publications on the SNRD news uh, um, letter. It's English, available in English and French in a short and a long version. We will have more debate upcoming next week here in Bonn on the 4th of July with BMZ, on the 5th of July within GIZ. So we are in the middle of this and everybody here 
who feels like wanting to contribute more to be part of the further debate, please feel free and write to us. It's a standing invitation, so to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you very much, Heike. Because all these, let me just one, add one sentence, all these also di um, um, unclarities, let me put it like this, whether mechanization and professionalization in value chains adds to more or less employment. I find it particularly controversial to think about the, the role of agro-processing and the data Kwame presented on where is it exactly that the job opportunities are? I think there is still a lot to be debated about what the data tells us and what conclusions we draw for technical cooperation out of this. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to have such a good crowd here together today to also further discuss this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, and uh, I think it's a, it's a field where um, you said we are not at the beginning, we are midway, we already did uh, some assessment there, but still, it's something where it's a rather young field and uh, it's something where um, the employment promotion or the employment measurement in agricultural value chains, I think, did not get so much attention in the last 10 years as it is getting now. And I think you now it's a good moment uh, to assess this, this in further detail. and. Uh, and I agree, um, we still need to come to some conclusion there. What does this mean in the end, the data that have been presented? Yeah. Okay, thank you, Heike. Um, is there still some other comment? Uh, yeah, Alphonse, um, I sort of raised my, my name. Um, I would like to Add uh, on the discussion of automatism. Um, do we get better jobs or good jobs automatically? Um, I doubt this very much. Um, I think um, to get good jobs, uh, we also um, need to improve um, advocacy uh, at uh, farmers um, uh, organizational level um, also like unions um, better prices better uh, for agricultural commodities uh, these things do not come automatically yeah um, so um, I think um, getting good jobs, um, this needs to, that we have a particular look at employment and also um, really uh, make up our minds how in terms of policy uh, and not only government policy, but also uh, how can we stimulate uh, civil society uh, farmers' organizations in order to get at uh, better jobs. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eva. Uh, yeah, Eva Hart. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I fully agree. Getting good jobs does not come automatically. And I think that there our value chain approach um, has something to offer, like you already mentioned, uh, the representation of the interest of farmers through cooperatives a better organization or a better representation of interest at political level through lobbying uh, or other ways. Um, I think there um, we have something to offer and it's something where we can work on. But it's important to say that it does not come automatically, definitely. Yeah. So thank you very much. Very good comment. What I wanted to say when I, I wrote in the, in the comments bar that for Yemen uh, case, uh, during the crisis, the best solution for us to generate jobs was the agricultural sector using the value chain approach. And mm -hmm. it was very successful uh, during the, 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 the blockade and the shortage of fuel. And um, it also not opened the window, uh, it, it also um, opened the window for other subsectors like the biodiesel, because mm -hmm. we had the shortage of, of the fuel and the diesel 
we had to 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 do the value chain of the biodiesel from the the the, the used uh, cooking oil mm -hmm. and this um, uh, subsector we can say create other jobs to support the agriculture jobs and the farmers yeah so, um, uh, many people or many donors um, they refuse the idea that value chain could create jobs during the crisis because during the crisis enterprises support or agricultural support is just to have resilience not growth mm -hmm. in Yemen we had the proof that during the crisis in the agriculture sector using the value chain approach is, is really a very efficient way to create more jobs and have growth mm -hmm. um, 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 in, in, in this phase so that's what I want just to confirm uh, our experience here in Yemen until now and the projects are growing and the fund is increased uh, from USAID, from World Bank, for more value chain uh, uh, projects. Now we have also in the health sector and other uh, sectors to create jobs among the players. And that was my question because in the indicators uh, with the donors, we always emphasize on, on the jobs created in the production side. Uh, but when we go to field visits and our M&E people uh, visit the other players, they see better results and more growth in employment with the other players yeah. and we don't know is it to put it and direct beneficiaries or indirect beneficiaries and so on so that was just um uh, the missing point that i i, I just okay. wanted to clear it okay thank you very much fakri and now it was very clear we could understand you very well and i think uh, i would quickly like to comment uh, to on two things that you said on one side i must say I'm, so, I'm always surprised, but it's very good that even under the super difficult conditions in Yemen, um, under war conditions, you still manage to get good results out of the value chain projects. I think this is something what I find quite uh, exceptional. Um, it's something what I would not always expect, but it's very nice to hear uh, that you were able to get such results. And second, on your question, um, maybe in your project and for your donor um, they want you to focus on um, employment at at farm level at primary production level uh, maybe but in general it's not what we aim at in general we particularly aim at measuring also effects of employment at other levels in the value chain and even outside of the value chain if you have uh, some effect that other value chains benefit from what you are doing it's a result and it's a positive result and we should measure it. So it may depend on the individual project, on the donor, but in general, we would also, we are highly interested in what's going on at other levels, even as a priority. Okay, so very good to, to hear that uh, this has worked well in, in Yemen. I think, Karina, we need to come to a conclusion. Yes, I think we come to an end because we're also over time yet. I have to, I would like to mention actually uh, just very quickly three more points. So the first one is, uh, which uh, Heiko already mentioned briefly, that actually Kwame's work that he presented here today is actually part of a grant agreement that we have between the sector project, agricultural trade and value chains, uh, and the Michigan State University. And Next week, 5th of July, there will be an expert talk where this work uh, and also other inputs will be discussed. So there's uh, yeah, more room for discussion on this topic. And I think you uh, hopefully all received the invitation. There's also the option to participate via Skype for Business. Uh, so if you're interested and haven't received the invitation yet, then just let us know that we can forward it um, to you. Uh, the second thing is that um, this uh, webinar is today is actually the last one within the series. Um, so now we would like to um, evaluate a bit um, and then um, start with another with a second round uh, in September. So it would be really nice to also get your feedback um, uh, and also ideas for maybe further topics. So if you have ideas, uh, critique, uh, recommendations, just send them to us via email. We're very happy to receive uh, your feedback to improve um, on the series. And the third point is actually um, regarding the video of this webinar. Um, as soon as it is um, yeah, ready uh, and is online on the SNID website, we will share with you the link as well as the PowerPoint slides 
um, as always. Yes, and with this, I would like to thank you very much for your participation, especially thanks to Kwame for this really nice presentation and Frank also. Um, yes, um, have a very nice day and uh, see you then hopefully in September for the next round. Bye.